<laughs> All right, we're here. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being so incredibly patient with all of our technical uh, difficulties this morning and for adjusting. And uh, wasn't that just some special worship that we got to have this morning? If you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Matt, and I'm the lead pastor here at South Bay. And I get the privilege of being able to uh, just preach the word each and every week for us today, uh, or or each and every week here, to to be able to open the scriptures and to um, just share with you what I believe the Lord is saying for us. And so um, why don't we go ahead and grab our Bibles. If you don't have one with you, we have one for you underneath your seats, and you're welcome to use those today and take those home with you if you need a Bible at home. But let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. That's page 901. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. So it's so wonderful, again, just to have you all here on this morning. And of course, I do want to just give a special shout out to those of you who are watching online. So thankful that you're able to be a part. And I pray the Lord just blesses you through the preaching of his word today. Do not be afraid. It's one. All right. That's the end of the sermon. We'll just end it there. That's the whole thing. Thank you, Kim. Do not be afraid. It's one of the most repeated commands in all of Scripture. Echoed throughout the the pages of the Old and New Testament is this exhortation from the Lord to his people over and over again. Fear not. Be courageous. Do not be afraid. Still, often, um, we are afraid, aren't we? Think about it. Um, When's the last time that you were really nervous about a particular situation? Or uh, how many of us have ever felt deeply overwhelmed by what's happening to us and around us? Uh, Who in this room or or watching online today has ever had a personal concern so great that, that you actually had to reach out and ask for help? The truth is, all of us have found ourselves in a circumstance where we are incredibly vulnerable. When we realize that we are helpless and insufficient for quickly fixing fixing, um, whatever problem has come our way, we immediately shift into some degree of panic and fear. You see, fear is, without question, a routine part of the human condition. And it is not beyond us to even be afraid to the point that we begin to even question if God can help us. Let's get real here this morning. I know we're in a room filled with a bunch of Christian believers and we've all developed the right churchy responses, but I hope you'll get really honest with yourself and with God this morning. Have you ever been in a position where you were so overcome by your situation that you didn't know if anything or anyone could actually help you, perhaps not even God himself. Fear, in its most basic form, is an individual's unfavorable concern with their personal state at any given moment. But the most destructive type of fear is when you are so consumed with your own dismay that you actually question God's power and ability to bring you through it. How much more angst is brought on to your already panicked state when you forget the power and sovereignty of Almighty God? And I believe that is why one of the other more frequented commands in all of the scriptures is is one word. So we have, um, do not be afraid. That's a pretty regular command in scripture but there's another one remember remember God's power 
Remember God's help. Remember how God showed up in the past. Remember your testimony. How God has healed and delivered you. Brothers and sisters, your testimony is a statement about the power of God. God's people, um, Revelation tells us, God's people will ultimately overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the words of their testimony. And so when we are afraid, afraid even to the point of doubting God, we need only to remember. We see generations of God's people remembering throughout the Old and New Testament, from, from, from Moses to Samuel to the psalmist to the, the Apostle Paul. And so in an effort to help us remember, my hope is that today's message will come as a reminder of the all-powerful God who can move heaven and earth to help you and to bring your situation to peace. Today, we are continuing with week two of our current sermon series, Unto Us, Christ for Every Season. And the idea for this series originated in the words of the prophet Isaiah, which were spoken all the way back in the 8th century BC, when God gives a description to his people through Isaiah concerning the long-awaited Messiah that was going to bring salvation and redemption. Look what he says, recorded for us in Isaiah 9-6. I'm going to put it up with me on the screens. Isaiah says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Over 700 years before Jesus walked the earth, Isaiah had already given us a glimpse into who Jesus was going to be for us. And, and don't miss the first sentence. He's a, a child that is going to be born, but he, he's a son that is given to us. Isaiah describes the promised child as though he were a kind of Christmas gift, delivered to us for our good. And that is exactly what Jesus was. However, I think we know after reading this prophecy that receiving Jesus as a gift to the world is going to be infinitely better than receiving, say, a pack of socks. <laughs> Jesus is a very unique gift to us. In fact, his uniqueness can be quickly understood by just observing the name that he's given. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, last week, we walked through John 10, John chapter 10, and we were um, reading about Jesus as the wonderful counselor, or to use his own words, uh, the good shepherd. That said, I've been thinking all week about how our lives could be entirely different if we'd regularly remember Jesus as the mighty the Almighty God. Imagine with me, what are the consequences if Jesus is not Almighty God? How would you and I operate differently if Jesus is not all-powerful? Well, I think the first characteristic of our lo different lives would be that we'd be bound to our own circumstances. If Jesus is not almighty God, if Jesus is not all-powerful, then we are, are bound to our own circumstances. So whatever life throws at us is what we get. And there's no hope for better, and nothing is going to change except by coincidence and sheer luck. 
But if Jesus is not Almighty God, then we'd also be fighting in our own strength. So we're bound to our own circumstances, but we're also having to deal with it, having to endure, having to somehow make it out of it in our own strength. You'd be the only one who could change your circumstances. And so you better hope that you're wise and powerful enough to deliver yourself from whatever it is you're going through. (laughs) If Jesus is not Almighty God, we'd be bound to our own circumstances. We'd be fighting in our own strength, but we'd also be paralyzed by fear. We'd become paralyzed by fear. You, you'd constantly be worried and, and on edge about what might go wrong or what people might do to you or say here or what losses you might have or, or what diagnosis you might get. And, and you're just, you begin to just live this very quiet, like scared, cowardly type of life. <laughs> now, look with me on the screens, wherever you can see the screen. Isn't it interesting, isn't it ironic that even though Jesus is Almighty God and even though most of us put our faith in that very truth, we still live like the people that I've described on the screen. In other words, no matter how much we say that Jesus is Almighty God, no matter how much we've sung about the, the miracle-making, powerful, changing... <laughs> Where's that lyric sheet? It's a new song. It's a new song. That, that, yeah, it's a new song. Thank you. No matter how much we sing about this powerful, almighty name of Jesus... Virtually all of us live our lives as though Jesus isn't almighty, all-powerful. We live like we are bound to our circumstances. Nothing can change. We're a hopeless generation. We live, we, we function as though we are fighting in our own strength. So I, I have to, it's the whole thing of the, that's what all the self-help movement is about. <laughs> all these books you find on the shelves at Target or wherever, you know, Barnes and Noble, the self-help stuff, that's, that's the premise is that you have, to, you have to help yourself, you have to free yourself, you have to protect yourself. And then of course, as I pointed out just a few moments ago, We already operate in in such a way where we are paralyzed by fear. We walk around like we're victims, not victors in Christ. And so this is why, it's, it's all the more reason why we need to always remember the wonder working, miraculous, almighty power of Jesus. That's the only way to hope. That's the only way to healing. That's the only way to a fearless, God-based, God-rooted confidence. And listen, hear me out. I'm not saying that there's never any reason for concern or pain or grief. Those are all very real emotions that we need to feel and process. But when we grieve and and when we suffer and when we experience difficult circumstances um, that, that overwhelm us, we must experience it all as people who have hope because there is a new story. There is a prophecy that has been fulfilled telling us the simple truth that Jesus has come to us for us, and he is the almighty God. And so that reality has to inspire an entirely different posture in the lives that we live, so that we're becoming people who are walking in faith and hope and confidence. So what I want to do today is just to share four testimonies Four testimonies that are recorded for us actually in the Gospel of Matthew. 
And the testimonies are going to remind us of Jesus, whose name, remember the name tells you something about the person. So his name, Isaiah says, is Almighty God. So that's what I want to read today. Um, it's a longer passage than usual, so it's actually not going to be with me on the screens. So I want you to turn there. Um, Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to read through it quickly. Matthew chapter 8, page 901 in your church Bibles. And we're going to begin in verse 23. Verse 23. Four stories here. Story number one. And when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then Jesus rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? Story 2. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged Jesus, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the de demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Story 3. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to Jesus a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, don't miss that, that's funny to me. It's like, okay, you don't think I can hear you? But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, and he then turned to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And the man rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Story number four. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And Matthew rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, Jesus said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came to call, not to call the righteous, but sinners. Hmm. 
The portion of scripture that we just read tells us about Jesus in his prime season of ministry. The gospel is being preached, miracles are happening, the kingdom of God is being proclaimed and realized on the earth. And Jesus and his disciples have been incredibly busy joining in God's work. It's a lot to take in, I know, but, but I hope that you noticed the one consistent element which carried over from story to story throughout our text. Namely, the suffering people who needed divine intervention. These different people were dependent on the all-powerfulness of Jesus. They needed Jesus to live up to his God-given name, which is Almighty God. So um, let's just begin by observing Testimony 1, An Unexpected Storm. The first story takes place out on a boat in the Sea of Galilee. And as you probably know, Jesus and his disciples actually all grew up right around this body of water. And some of them even had a short-lived career as professional fishermen. Meaning that Jesus and his disciples were very familiar with the sea that they were traveling through in this story. It was also a routine occurrence with the Sea of Galilee to have an unexpected storm develop. Of course, uh, on the day that these men had decided to take a ride across the water, a large storm did in fact show up. But apparently, this storm was not just your typical rain shower. We know that because, one, how the scripture describes the strength of the waves, and two, because of how the scripture describes the fear of the men who have been sailing these waters their, their entire lives. But the text says that the waves were reaching so high that the water was starting to flood the boat. Seems like a pretty dangerous situation. The disciples could very well drown and, and die if the boat is overturned. So, of course, they're in a panic. I mean, who wouldn't be in a panic? Well, it seems Jesus wouldn't be. All this time, Jesus is asleep. That seems a bit inconsiderate of him. The disciples were, were very scared and probably a little upset. And so they wake Jesus up and they say to him, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. We're dying here. Jesus was probably a little upset that the disciples woke him up from his nap, which is why he responded in the way that he did. He says, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? Notice how Jesus here correlates faith with a lack of, or fear with a lack of faith. There's this connection. The disciples who had been with Jesus for a while now, the, the same disciples who were alongside him for months of preaching and, and had watched multiple miracles, which we read about in the text just before what we read today, they, they saw people healed and, 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 and demons released and all these things, and they still hadn't realized that Jesus has all power. They must have taken him for some religious magician or something. But what we know is that they, they certainly didn't recognize Jesus as the Almighty God, at least not at this point. And that's confirmed in the disciples' question, which they ask right after Jesus rebukes the storm and calms the sea. They say, who is this man that even winds and seas obey him? There are also undoubtedly many unexpected but powerful um, storms, figuratively speaking, that you and I face in this life. Am I right in saying that? Yes. yes. Maybe you're let go from your job and you don't know how you're going to pay the rent. Or maybe you um, get in a really big argument with your spouse and the next day they suddenly file for divorce. Your neighbors make some absurd accusation against you which gets you into some legal trouble whatever just think of 
the last thing that randomly happened to you causing a bit of a challenge in your life. You are almost immediately, I would imagine, taken over by fear and angst. What's going to happen to me? What are the, the consequences of a storm this great? Well, just like the winds that are caused that, that cause the boat to be swamped with the waves, so our lives are flooded with grief in those moments. The sudden tragedies of life can ultimately devastate us depending on their severity. And if the disciples had allowed their boat to keep filling with water, they could have potentially been brought to death. Instead, what they needed to do was to turn to the one who was laid out, snoring away. Now, as an aside, I'd like to just present a question that you're probably all asking. Why is Jesus asleep? Why is Jesus asleep? Well, it, it could be because just like any of us, Jesus wanted to relax after a, a long few days of, of hard work. Another reason is because Jesus is obviously not as concerned about the situation as the disciples are. But let's just take the question a bit deeper, shall we? Why is Jesus, the all-powerful, almighty God, asleep while his people are suffering? I think that question reaches a little further in, doesn't it? Think of the larger tragedies that arise. Consider the, the great um, dangers that we face. Sometimes it seems that Jesus is over somewhere by himself taking a nap. And we ask the question, why is Jesus asleep? It's a reworded version of another common question of our day. Why doesn't an all-powerful God stop our suffering. Let me just say, I don't fully know the answer to that question. Probably no one does. I do know how the presence of sin and our free will plays in a factor into that. I also know that it isn't because he couldn't stop it. However, what we see in this text and throughout the rest of this passage and what we see in the larger story of redemption it is not that Jesus prevents our suffering but that he meets us in our suffering and that he's with us as we endure it giving us help on the other side of it. That's really the good news, the gospel in a nutshell that Jesus joined us in our suffering. That he gave us himself in the midst of it. And that he offers us help to overcome that suffering and all the grief that it could bring. But let's return to the story. The disciples wake Jesus up saying, save us Lord, we are perishing. And so what does Jesus do? He, he rebukes the men for their doubt. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, he, he says that Jesus spoke to the men first, for they were the most difficult to deal with. The wind and sea could be rebuked afterwards. <laughs> Again, Matthew Henry, uh, the theologian and Bible teacher from many centuries ago, he, he comments, Jesus does not chide them for disturbing him with their prayers, but for disturbing themselves with their fears. The truth is, the men had failed to recognize Jesus for who he truly is, the almighty God. But Jesus stood up, he faced the storm, and he rebuked it. I love that it doesn't say he quieted the storm or calmed the storm. Instead, Jesus rebuked it, and the storm stopped. It ceased. 
And so in this, we see how Jesus reigns over all of the unexpected storms, both in creation, but more so in our lives. Now, we continue into testimony two. One Lord, two demons, and a herd of pigs. Uh, when Jesus brings the disciples through the storm across the Sea of Galilee, um, they, they arrive at the homeland of the Gadarenes. Now, your translation may say the Gerasenes, but don't get too caught up on that. I can explain that another time. Um, when they get to their destination, two, men possess, or two demon-possessed men come walking from the tombs to meet Jesus, and they're obviously displaying some sort of uh, dangerous behavior. However, I want you to notice the response of the demons when they are in the presence of Jesus. Let's just look together. Verse 29. And behold, the demons cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? So, the demons recognize the Son of God. And let's just contrast that with the last story. The disciples in the previous passage say, Who is this man? The demons answer that question. Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, the faith of the demons was more robust than the faith of the disciples. The demons had a better understanding of the almighty power of Jesus than Jesus' own followers did. And what happens? That causes the demons to be afraid. They ask Jesus, have you come to torment us before the time? Before what time? Well, the demons know that their ultimate destiny is to be defeated and destroyed, along with all the rest of evil, but they are wondering if Jesus intends to end their work sooner. Again, the demons reveal their inferiority to the Son of God when they say in verse 31, if you cast us out, send us away to the herd of pigs. They know better than to think that they can just resist Jesus' command. And so what they ask to do is that, that Jesus would res lead them to reside in the pigs instead of being destroyed. So Jesus directs the demons to leave the two men and to enter into the pigs. And, and then what happens? The demons kill the pigs. The demons kill the pigs. The, the demons send them into the waters to drown. And the truth is, if the demons had been left with the men, that is what the demons would have eventually done to the men. Because the demons, just like their evil boss man, who we call Satan, they're only coming to steal, kill, and destroy. Still, uh, southern, still, kill, and destroy. But at least now, the men were set free. Now, an odd thing happens at the end of the story. For some weird reason, the people of the region were very upset about what Jesus had done. However, I'm certain that the former demon-possessed men were very ecstatic. But overall, the particular testimony shows us how Jesus is powerful over all the schemes of the enemy. Now listen, you can trust me. If you know me at all, you know that I am not one to believe that there's a devil behind every bush or that every sickness is an evil spirit or that the devil dropped a nail on the highway to give me a flat tire so I wouldn't make it to church this morning. I'm, I'm not that kind of preacher. I've never been that kind of preacher. And, and I don't necessarily think that's how the devil and his workers attack us or attack the world. Um, to be honest, I, I think we give the devil way too much credit. Uh, although in our attempt to not credit everything to the devil we have now swung the pendulum to the other extreme as though there is no enemy to watch out for. Even in the name of Jesus, we've claimed that evil is defeated so that it no longer has any power at all. But do me a favor. Flatter me a little bit. Go watch the news and tell me again that you don't think evil has any power or that the demonic no longer exists. Observe the world around you and explain to me how you believe the enemy of our souls has just decided to give up and chill out on the recliner. In our theological statements, we believe, at least in theory, in this idea of spiritual warfare. 
That's a New Testament post-resurrection concept, by the way. But even if we agree with it in theory, we don't often abide by it pragmatically. Now, I, I don't have time to go into a long theology of the demonic, but um, there's a great book called Deliverance by John Thompson I'd recommend. Uh, either way, the overall point is if and when the devil or his workers seem to have entered into your story, having uh, deceived uh, you greatly and, and ultimately are working to destroy you, even then, when brought into the presence of Jesus, who is the Almighty God, the devils tremble and your soul is delivered. In other words, there is no addiction, no depression, no sinful habit that you cannot break that is so strong that Jesus cannot, in a moment, deliver you. Now, um, let's quickly move through testimony three, Jesus and the paralytic. Jesus takes another quick trip across the water, back to his hometown, and while he's there, a group of people had delivered a paralyzed man in need of healing. You probably read the same story in the other Gospels, and they tell us that he was actually lowered through the roof of the house to get to Jesus. Jesus' healings are almost always performed in response to faith. And the person who is ill or sick presses into Jesus in faith, and Jesus typically says something like, your faith has healed you. However, this time, if you notice in the text, he doesn't look to the faith of the paralytic. Jesus responds to the faith of the friends. Jesus saw their faith, and he looked at the man. So, uh, although healing is never promised to any of us, if you really want healing from whatever ails you, don't just try to increase your amount of faith, but also increase your amount of faith-filled friends. And then have your believing family and friends interceding on your behalf, and, and all of you are pursuing Jesus together for healing and believing together in power, and, and, and wait until the Almighty God heals you. Another interesting part of this story is that Jesus begins by forgiving the man's sin. I, I'm almost certain that this was not what they originally came for. Why would Jesus respond this way? Why does he, res why, why does he respond with a, a man who's a paralytic by saying your sins are forgiven? Probably for a few reasons. Um, one, to reveal the primary reason that Jesus came. He, he wanted to save us from something much worse than illness. And second, to show that he was able to perform a greater healing than mere physical healing, that, that Jesus is the healer of our bodies and our soul. And, and then finally, I think, to explain how all of our evils come from sin. And, and I don't mean just your sin, as in the sin that you do against God. What I mean is just the, the overall curse and presence of sin that came to us all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. So, uh, not all specific sicknesses, and I think this is very important to point out, not all sicknesses or illness or diseases or, or bodily ailments are, are from your sin. Now, that was a popular belief of that day um, among the religious leaders that if, if you got sick, you must not be living right. <laughs> that was kind of the, the, the thought. Um, but Jesus corrects that. But also, what we know is that that's not necessarily the case, that the, the reality of sin and disease and death is on us, is in the world. It was not created originally to be that way, but it came to us in sin in Genesis chapter 3. So then, after a brief interruption from the Pharisees and religious scribes, Jesus then gives physical healing to the man. He's revealing his power over sickness and disease, and not only that, but he also condemns those who doubted him. In that day, it was the religious, religious leaders. In this day, it could be your in-laws, your medical advisors, or, or scientists, or whoever, but um, let's face it. Jesus has the ability to heal your sin-sick soul and your tired body when you believe in faith, no matter what the church or the world may say. And finally, 
we have testimony for the power to start over. This is the most important part of this sermon today, so don't miss this. Our final story concerning the all-powerfulness of Jesus does not immediately appear to be quite as miraculous as the other stories. In our final story, Jesus isn't defying the laws of gravity or raising the dead or anything like that. And, and sometimes Jesus does work in a way that isn't super showy or seemingly unexplainable, but his quieter works are equally as significant. Amen? In this case, the miracle is that Jesus has a meal with a tax collector. In case you didn't know, tax collectors were pretty much universally understood in that day as the scum of the earth. They were um, getting the same level of respect that most people today give child abusers. And in the ancient world, the Roman government had a tax that everyone had to pay. However, your local tax collector could also add a personal tax for essentially however much he wanted to add. And most tax collectors would add this insane tax for themselves on top of the government tax that the people had already paid. And so the tax collectors were seen as greedy pigs who deserved nothing except wrath. And though many of them had brought it on themselves, it was a bit of a sad situation. Because anyone who went into this business was now going to be a social outcast. No one even wanted to be caught at dinner with a tax collector. At least, until Jesus came. Until Jesus showed up. Jesus passes by a young man named Levi, who eventually is renamed as Matthew. And Matthew was a tax collector when Jesus invited him to come be one of his disciples. So Jesus welcomed Matthew, the dirty, rotten, greedy tax collector, to come join his family. And not only Matthew, but apparently many other tax collectors and sinners were invited to come into the family. Why do I share that story as a part of today's message? It seems a bit out of place. Here's why. Because even though Jesus has the power to calm the seas, and even though he can deliver the oppressed, and even if he can heal our ailments, Jesus also has the power to redefine our person. So wh whoever the world said you were, <laughs> whoever you actually were, good or bad as you may be, maybe even far worse than you ever thought you could become, none of that, what the world says or what you believed about yourself, none of that stands a chance against the new person that Jesus has the power to make you into. Perhaps you can find a friend to help you navigate difficult situations, the storms that come up. Or, or, or maybe you can find a, a biblical counselor to advise you through hard-to-break sinful patterns. Or, or, or perhaps you could even find a doctor or a surgeon to remove a cancerous mass from your stomach. But there's only one person who is able to look past your past, love you in your most unlovable state, and ultimately make you into a new person. And that is Jesus, the Almighty God. Church, what I hope God will show you, or, or in better words, to remind you of today, is how different the world is and how different your life can be when you recognize Jesus not only as the one who loves you deeply, but also as the Almighty God. The one who sees you and knows you and guides you through all of life also has the power to change your life. He can change your circumstances. He can change your story too. And so you and I can live with more hope, more peace, and more confidence this morning when we recognize this key truth concerning Jesus, that the Almighty God is fully able, fully able to defend and deliver, restore, and redeem. When we fail to remember this, we get stuck. We feel defeated. We grow weary. 
Instead, the prophecy has been fulfilled. Our Savior, Jesus, is the ruler and sustainer of all creation. And so if that is the case, which I believe it is, then we should pray bolder prayers. We should live with greater faith. We should walk in freedom for who Christ and his power has made us to be. And along the way, we just continue to look back and remember how he has saved you in the past, knowing that he will save you in the future. No person, no situation, no affliction, no reputation is able to come against the person and work of Jesus. He has healed and he will heal. He has renewed and he will renew. He has delivered and he will deliver. Jesus is the sovereign authority over heaven, earth, and everything in between. That is the good news today, that Jesus is the almighty God. And so, um, let us pray. God, I thank you for the truth of your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you have encouraged us in reminding us this morning who you are, whose we are. And and Lord, that you have shown us your almighty power to save and deliver and heal and free and defend. Thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you're for us and not against us. Help us, Lord, today. Pierce our hearts with your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, at this time, we're going to move into our time of worship through giving and generosity. And um, this is not a, a break from our worship or a way to wrap up service. This is very much a part of our worship that we get to join in together, myself included, and to just bless the Lord, bless his work with um, all that he has blessed us with. Um, Now, as you may recall, these last few weeks, we've been um, going through our Christmas offering. This is our annual offering that goes not to Pastor Matt or to a staff or or to anything other than a few special ministry initiatives. Um, A couple weeks ago, we talked about Um, the neighborhood block parties that we're doing to go and just um, have fun and serve the people in our local neighborhoods but also to be able to minister to them and then last week we talked about 15 things you can do with a 15 passenger church van how how incredible is that going to be next year that we're going to be able to get that Um, but today I wanted to do something a little more special Um, you guys probably received some of these last week these Christmas service invite cards Um, Do you know that all of these cards, all of our postcards that go out in the mail, everything like that is funded through the Christmas offering? Now, that may not seem like a big deal, but let's do this. How many of you sitting in this room right now came because of a postcard or an invite card or an invite from someone in this church? Raise your hands. Yeah. So many of us, right? So many of us came from, from something like this, something that was on a, a, a piece of cardstock like this, an invite from a friend or from a postcard in the mail, and now you're a part of this church family. And I just, I've been thinking about this, about who might you invite this year to our Christmas Eve services to come be a part and, and hand them one of these cards funded by the Christmas offering. And to be able to invite them to church and they might join in our family and and be a part of what the Lord's doing here at South Bay. And most of all, that they might find hope in the gospel, right? And so think about um, three of your neighbors or family members or um, friends or co-workers, whoever. Think, Think three names right now. Now, what I'm gonna do is Um, Our ushers are going to go ahead and pass out some of these invite cards. Go ahead and let's do that now. And what I want you to do, everybody's going to take one, even if you got one last week. That means you can invite six people. Right? Amen. What I want you to do I want you to think about those three names, three family members, three friends, three co-workers who you'd like to invite to service this year. 
And I want you to hold the cards in your hands. And I'm going to pray. But while I'm praying, I want you to be praying about those three people. That their, their hearts would be receptive to the invitation. And that you would have the boldness to go and invite them. All right? There's an empty seat all around every one of us right now. We want to fill every one of these seats on Christmas Eve. So let's hold those cards. I'm going to pray. You be praying for your three people. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this church, Lord, for how you're encouraging our family here. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would be burdened with some people who we'd like to bring into this room. Lord, that they would come and, and hear the good news of the gospel. That's what we're talking about on the 24th of this month. Lord, would you fill this room with people, Lord, who need that hope to hear that you are the Prince of Peace who has made peace with us and God and with us and each other. That is the good news of Christmas. And that is what we wait for, the coming peace that you will bring. Lord, if we don't have three names, Lord, bring to our mind three names of people who need to be in this room on that meeting. And Lord, give us all the courage to invite them, to simply hand them one of these invite cards and to ask them to join us for Christmas Eve this year. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our ushers are going to receive our tithes and offerings as well as our communi or communication cards and our Christmas offering. So if you want to give to the Christmas offering today, there's an envelope in the seats in front of you. You can put your funds in there and mark it for Christmas offering. If you're watching online today, you have an opportunity to give as well. You can text GIVE to the number on the screen. And then if you want to give to the Christmas offering, make sure you mark that in the box. Hey, I'm so thankful you guys all were here today, and I'm so thankful for those of you who watched online. We do have fellowship out in the tent, so um, feel free to come back there. We have bagels and donuts and buttered rolls and coffee and teas and juices and yogurts and, and all kinds of things. But we also have each other out there. We'd love for you to come sit around a table, have a light breakfast. It's completely free. Come and join us out there. Hey, let's stand for our benediction. And just as a way of bringing our body into prayer and, and just letting him know that we are open, Lord, for whatever you have for us. Let's put our hands out in a posture of receiving from him. God, we thank you, Lord, that you gave us your presence this morning to gather in this house. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the church. And Lord, I pray for every person here in this room or watching online today that you would bless us and keep us, that you'd shine your face down on us, and that you'd give us your peace. So now, in the knowledge of your word and in the power of your spirit, Lord, send us out and bring us back together at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may go in peace.